A very warm welcome to our session on Gaia-X data sovereignty and data spaces. Uh, this is a quite exciting session we will have in the next hours, um, a session that is two split, and it will all go around or about the road to European digital sovereignty with Gaia-X and Fiware powering really up the next generation of data spaces. And we, of course, want to give it a nice entry, as this is a very wide field of wide and wild field, I almost have to say, but obviously a wide field of topics that we could cover today. But what we what we definitely want to do is to allow you all um, a good insight into the state of the art with Fiverr. And we will have an introduction by our Fiverr CTO, Juan Cujero, today who will talk about Fiware for data spaces. And then followed by um, a very nice and absolutely up-to-date presentation with Dennis Wendland, who will uh, guide us through towards materialization of data spaces, um, looking at a great demo, a I for Trust demo, um, coming from a project where Fiverr is currently strongly working on and um, having started dissemination also into the market. So I think we can be all very excited to see a little bit more hands on how that looks on a demo. And we will then after the first 30 minutes, deep dive a bit, we will have a great panel discussion with an amazing lineup of speakers. And we will have the time to introduce them later on in more detail, but I just give you the names. We will have Davo Mersman with us, the CEO from uh, our, um, OASC. We have Lars Nagel, CEO from IDSA, Dr. Sabine Wilfling, a unit leader from SHARE, and Ilka Lakanyemi, um, who will um, join us from um, from a data spaces business committee and architecture working group, also a very active member in Gaia X, and we will have Andrea Lampe as well. So um, I would now give it a quick start so we don't lose more time and uh, open the door and the stage to the next exciting topics and hand over with that to Juan Cojero, CTO of Fiber Foundation. Juanco, the stage is yours. Thank you, Christina. And I will be sharing my screen. Uh, so let me go to the presentation and place it in presentation mode. I hope you can confirm you are uh, watching this the slides full screen. Yes. All right. Thank you. So let's let's um, uh, talk a little bit uh, as Christina has mentioned um, about what is uh, going on regarding these hot topics nowadays of the data spaces uh, within Fiverr. Um, um, and as you know, and, and I can anticipate, it's all about moving from vision to execution. And that's what we are doing. I will uh, talk a little bit about the vision, but then Dennis will be demonstrating how we are moving to execution. But let's first, with the introduction, what are data spaces? Uh, data spaces are infrastructure uh, that um, are intended to uh, be there to um, enable the creation of ecosystems around the uh, effective and trusted sharing of data among different participants. Um, sometimes an analogy I, 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 I love to explain what data spaces could be is, is the kind of the GSM of data enabling um, such kind of ecosystems to flourish. And um, uh, it is ambition, and that's the reason why this is so much a, a hot topic, that data spaces uh, will be the, the kind of uh, infrastructures that we really will boost an, a new generation of uh, innovative digital services that will be based on sharing of data, sharing of data, among different organizations, breaking the information silos uh, uh, among those organizations, which so far in many cases had been um, working in, in rather isolated manner without the ability to get and unleash the, the whole potential of, of data. Because of that, data spaces are also going to be the centerpiece in the development of the concept of data economy. Um, um, uh, enabling the creation of uh, multi-site markets involved 
in different actors, both from public sector, private sectors, and also being able to trigger the creation of value out of data. I think someone has to mute the mic to avoid that we have a an echo. Um, uh, there are two relevant papers that anyone that wishes to get introduced in the topic of data spaces, we recommend you to uh, follow. Uh, one, the first one was produced by a, a quite large number of uh, experts uh, that were brought together in the context of a project called OpenDI. And uh, that um, effort task force was uh, very nicely coordinated by IDSA, and that led to the development of uh, this white paper, uh, Design Principles for Data Spaces. You can Google for that, and we, you will uh, find it in the slides. When uh, they will be available, you will uh, have the link. That Design Principles for Data Spaces are, of course, very high level um, on the basic concepts, uh, helping to understand Complementary to that, but very much aligned, uh, we, uh, the Firewall Foundation, launched a, a new position paper we announced yesterday, Firewall for Data Spaces, where we are elaborating how those uh, design principles can actually be materialized in the uh, using firewall technologies for really, you know, moving to execution and, and, and creating uh, effective and trusted exchange of data. This is a bit the building blocks, uh, taxonomy of building blocks that within that paper from Open Day was uh, were presented and the uh, and are the kind of uh, technologies on one side those uh, building blocks in orange color that uh, uh, will enable the creation of the infrastructure needed and also the complementary global services needed for creation of data spaces building blocks that can be categorized categorized in building blocks connected to uh, the ability to ensure interoperability among the participants, building blocks that are related to how to support data sovereignty and trust in the data exchange. And last but not least, uh, building technology, building blocks connected to how I can create value out of data. Besides those technology building blocks, there are other kind of building blocks that are necessary for creating data space that have to do with the governance, with the kind of corporations and legal agreements that have to be put in place to ensure a trusted um, data exchange. This is a bit the generic aspect, and but what do we mean by data space powered by fireware? Uh, it's not about any kind of data exchange. Uh, we really go to a very concrete approach in the way we implement data spaces. Why? Because we want to really be able to support effective exchange of data. And that means requiring that all participants really speak the same language. And speaking the same language means, uh, first of all, adopting a common API for data exchange. That is the sentences you construct, the data models, the vocabulary, what you speak about, and common mechanisms for identity and access management. And those are things about which Fiverr in Fiverr we make choices to really uh, boost uh, the aspects that has to do with uh, really be effective in this data sharing. And that means that we are going for a, a data exchange where what participants in data spaces are exchanging is digital twin data. Uh, and digital twin data using um, and, uh, the standards that I will promote. Actually, this is a bit the reason why we say the data spaces are a kind of a natural next step in the evolution of uh, organizations that have already adopted uh, 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 Fiverr. In that sense, with uh, relying on this digital twin approach uh, as is bringing the, the basis for creating the architecture of the mass solutions, the way uh, 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 systems can be integrated within a given organization and the very natural next steps and that is what we will bring with data spaces powered by fireware is the ability that the different systems will be exchanging a common digital twin representation of the world where each of the actors will be uh, sharing data that uh, enrich that digital twin representation and other actors can um, um, uh, read the attributes of entities that may be coming from other systems and on the other hand, 
um, place in in return to uh, um, enrich that digital twin representation themselves for the benefits of other. Everything, of course, with the highest value and and and, and ability to support um, uh, enforcement of access and usage control mechanisms. So, with a picture which is uh, the one that we also uh, are adopting for uh, uh, introducing the concept of building blocks for data spaces and fireware, that is fully aligned with the one that uh, I was uh, displaying before coming from the Open Day uh, white paper. What we are doing is going to the step that regarding technology building blocks, we are making choices, making choices for all these building blocks to make sure that we create a solid infrastructure that uh, uh, will um, uh, support the kind of uh, exchange. Uh, two uh, concepts uh, uh, have guided the decisions going further. One is a go for um, technologies that are available open source and, um, and can uh, be part of our fiber, uh, fiber catalog. And also very important is the alignment with an initiative in Europe that is very much important from our perspective, which is the Connecting Europe Facility Program. Let's go now through each of these three pillars to elaborate a bit what is the vision, what are the terms of references, what are the kind of activities we are forcing uh, moving forward. So data interoperability, as I explained before, uh, the, the vision is pretty simple. Participants of data space powered by fireware are sharing a digital twin data representation of the world and the actual kind of data they change is digital twin data and they do so in near real time. What are the terms of reference? The standards that we are adopting is NGS ILD API for the right time digital twin data exchange. Um, the vocabularies uh, uh, is, is an aspect that will be uh, uh, um, enriched by collaboration between the participants. And here, the Smart Data Models Initiative becomes a reference about data models that can be reused. And very important, the alignment with, with two uh, major building blocks, like the, the Context Broker and the European Blockchain, uh, blockchain Service Infrastructure, because besides the NGS ILD, besides the data models, in what refers to uh, uh, traceability of um, transactions and so on, we rely, want to rely on the kind of uh, integration components that are now part of Fiber Release 8 and that uh, will be developed toward uh, in connection with the Etsy uh, 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 Connecting Euro Facility Building Block. We will be, of course, doing activities towards evolution the, of the NGS ILD API contributing to enrich the portfolio of smart data models initiative coming from different domains and, um, and well, uh, working uh, together with the, uh, uh, the uh, organization behind the Connecting Europe facility in achieving this integration with uh, the European blockchain service infrastructure. Regarding data sovereignty and trust, the vision is that of, of providing a solid common identity and access management framework that allows to perform um, uh, and enforce access and usage policies, not only at the organization level involving the participant, but also at the level of users of applications within each organization, targeting usage control in the longer term, but trying to solve now the issues uh, linked to uh, managing identity and access management in highly distributed architectures. The kind of uh, standards we are adopting, uh, we really go for things that are widely adopted in the market, OpenID Connect or 2XACML. Um, and um, we will be working together with IDS in see how these technologies can um, 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 integrate with, with the core concept of IDS connector to support uh, trusted uh, data exchange and, and further usage control. Um, activities will actually be concentrated in, in achieving this integration of the different elements and, uh, and trying to bring a, a solid framework uh, supporting highly distributed systems. And we expect that uh, uh, part of the work we are going to be, uh, to be done uh, um, 
could be a good input for um, an initiative like GAIAX. Data value creation is the third pillar and as important as the other two. And here is, is about uh, the ability to publish offerings around data resources by the different participants, being able to even not just define terms and conditions, policies to be enforced, but also the ability to assign prices and create offerings and how to integrate this with uh, 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 the standards that exist regarding data publication. Uh, here, terms of reference are TM forum, open APIs and specifications in what regards everything connected to marketplaces for data and data services, and uh, regarding publication, DCAT AP or DCAT uh, standards are, of course, the basis. Activities going on is uh, how we will uh, try to integrate this in a more solid uh, manner. Uh, so far, still the components uh, are a little bit in independent. We want to integrate it uh, further for upcoming releases, but we have a really solid foundation here. Um, I already mentioned this alignment with the set building block, so I will not insist on that. And um, um, uh, simply mentioning that all these components will be part now of a specific section within the firmware releases, starting with firmware release eight, with all those components being available open source that uh, people can, organizations can pick up, combine and integrate perhaps with other services to create data spaces. That is what we are doing in with a project like Eiffel Trust, but that is what uh, others could be doing for creating IBS compliant, compliant data spaces. But this is a bit the vision, and now I want to move to uh, a demo that uh, demonstrate this all working, and I will give the floor to um, Dennis. So I will be stop sharing to prove uh, that this is not just theory, it's, it's software that works and is already available. Dennis, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Juanro, and welcome to everyone. I hope you can see my screen and now my slides. So, yes. what, yeah, thanks. Um, so what I want to show now in this uh, short presentation is um, a proof of concept we developed uh, with respect to the project uh, called i for trust um, implementing such trusted data space. And um, first giving you a quick overview on this proof of concept, um, then showing the demo. And at the end, um, I will show a bit um, what happens behind uh, the scenes uh, and then give some technical insights. So starting with the overview. Um, so what, what we want to show is um, in, in such a trusted data space on, on how to delegate the access rights uh, for a data service um, from an organizational level to a user level so that in the end, um, such service provider does not need to have any knowledge about the users which, which finally access um, this service of the data provider. So, and for this, we thought about some use case presented here um, where different parties are involved. And on the one hand, we have this packet delivery company. So that's a um, company offering uh, delivery order services and also ordering a digital uh, service to uh, view or change um, delivery orders um, on, on some portal of application um there and they want to offer uh, this service now on a marketplace which is this i for trust marketplace here um providing it with different service levels with, with a basic one where you can just view your delivery orders and um see when, when your packet uh, will arrive and, and, and which address and everything and in a premium service where um Users could also change particular attributes like the planned time or the planned date of arrival or the delivery address. And then there might be different retailers now, some some online shops um, that will acquire this offering on this marketplace. And then 
delegate these access rights to their customers um, so that when these customers now are shopping uh, on their systems and um, placing an order, and then a delivery order gets created, and then having the possibility now via this portal of the packet delivery company to change certain attributes of their delivery orders. And as a fifth party here, we have this trust authority, which is an, also called a satellite, um, which will ensure trust among these different organizations and uh, allows every party to to check um, whether it can trust the requests coming from other parties. So in this demo, um, different steps are involved. The first one would be now um, where such an employee of this packet delivery company would create an offering now in this marketplace. This is something I won't show now given the short amount of time I have. So I already prepared these offerings here from the packet delivery company. But uh, what I will show is now how from such shop here like this Happy Pets, which is some uh, shop for, for pets articles, um, some employee here will, will acquire this offering and then um, such customer of this Happy Pet shop uh, will be able to view and also change parameters on this portal application of the package delivery company. So I'm quitting now the presentation. Um, what I will start with is now, um, I am in this portal of this packet delivery company. I will just try now to, to access such delivery order, although this offering was not acquired by, by this Happy Pets company. So what I can will do now is, um, so I'm a customer of this Happy Pets shop, and I'm logging in now using the IDP of Happy Pets. And now I will try to retrieve the information of a particular um, delivery order, which is having this ID here now. And I'm getting an error now because I'm not allowed to do this. Okay, so now um, moving to the marketplace. Um, now consider now I'm, I'm an employee of this Happy Pets company, so I'm logging in on the marketplace and I'm shown different uh, identity providers here and I'm choosing the one belonging to my organization. So I'm forwarded now to my own IDP and can, can log in with my own credentials on this marketplace. And now I'm seeing here different uh, service offerings. And what I'm looking for is now this one from the packet delivery. As you can see, there's a basic and a premium one. Um, I want to choose this premium service, uh, which will allow me to do uh, read uh, and write access on these delivery orders. Uh, also checking the characteristics of such service. As you can see then in the behind there, there's an NGS ILD um, uh, context pro broker running, providing this NGS ILD API. So these delivery orders are represented by, by entities in the end in the context broker. Um, there's a particular endpoint uh, for, for accessing this API. And I can also see um, on, on, on what entity types I will be allowed to to access, which is a type of delivery order. And then also I will, can see that I will be allowed to do uh, get requests for, for all of the attributes and to do patch requests only on certain attributes. In this case, it's just the planned time and the planned date of arrival. So I'm adding this to my card now to agree on the terms and conditions. Also see there's a price plan, so it's a monthly payment of 500 euros. And I'm now checking out. Now forwarded to PayPal, or actually it's PayPal sandbox now. And let's choose the Visa card. Now I'm approving this payment, or this monthly payment, and should be getting redirected now to the marketplace, yes. So now this offering has been acquired. So now let's try again 
being now the shop customer to access uh, the delivery order again. As you can see, now it worked. So access was granted and I'm now presented such such information about the delivery order. And since it's, it was this premium offering, I should be also allowed now not only to, to send GET requests to this context broker, but also to send patch requests, which will be done now if I want to change here something. So let's say uh, not at home at 10. So let's um, move the delivery to the evening. So now in the background, a patch request is sent and a GET again and now this value has changed. So basically that's it about the demo. Now I'm returning to my presentation now to show a bit now what actually happened now uh, behind the scenes. Um, I'll be first giving you a quick overview on the architecture we, we have here. So as you've seen, there's some marketplace application that's basically the Fiverr Business API ecosystem. Um, on the service provider side, there's this uh, uh, Orient LD context broker. Um, it also has an IDP, which was used for the login of the employee. It's a marketplace, if I would have now shown how to, to create an offering. And the service is protected by PEP proxy and PDP, which is in this case uh, API umbrella. And we have also seen this portal application. And then there's also an authorization registry, which is currently provided by iShare. Um, where the um, policies are stored when when this uh, pipets organization has acquired access to this offering. And on the other hand, um, there are these retailer shops. We have only seen now Happy Pets, uh, also involving two different identity providers, uh, one for the employees, which was used for logging into the marketplace, and one for the customers, which was used for the customer to log in at the um, portal application, and they also have an authorization registry uh, where they store the policies to delegate access to their customers. So now quickly showing now what happened during these different steps. So during the acquisition of the offering, so when the employee of Happy Pets um, purchased the, the access to, to this premium service offering, um, there was first a login process. Um, between the marketplace and the Happy Pets uh, identity provider, uh, which is based on OpenID Connect. Um, this employee now um, um, selected this premium service offering and, and made the checkout and everything. And what happened then is that the marketplace itself created uh, a policy at the also relation registry at the packet delivery company um, stating that now the Happy Pets organization is allowed to delegate this get and patch requests access to their customers. This is also how such such policy generally looks like, um, which is generated at the step. So it's basically stating that some issuer, which is packet delivery company, uh, is issuing a policy to this Happy Pets organization, which are the IDs of these different uh, organizations within the trusted data space. Um, and this policy contains the right to access entities of type delivery order, um, to access any uh, entity ID, but uh, to only access particular attributes. And now doing the um, access to the service, um, there was also the, the login process of the customer on this portal application. And then this customer triggered uh, then a um, patch request sent to the context broker or rather to the API umbrella in front of the context broker to change a um, certain attribute. And this request um, contains a JSON web token that, which was obtained during this login process between the IDP of Happy Pets and the portal application where the, uh, which contains the rights um, that this customer was delegated within the organization. And now what Proxy is doing now is on the one hand checking whether um, this policy, uh, which was um, assigned to this customer by Happy Pets, uh, allows him to do this patch request on these entities. And uh, on the second hand, 
it will also check on its own authorization registry whether the SAPI Pets organization itself is actually allowed to delegate such access. And only if these two um, requirements are fulfilled, access is granted and the um, request is sent. And also here this um, somehow shows this chain of um, um, access rights here, so such policy change, chains um, where this, on the one hand, you have this policy stored at the registry of packet delivery company, uh, issuing the, the policy to the Happy Pets organization. And then there's also on the registry of Happy Pets organization, a policy issuing from Happy Pets to the final customer, which will access the service. Uh, Dennis, one minute, please. But I think yep. you are on the way, right? I'm, I'm basically through, but I'm handing over now again to Juanjo to yes, um, say the final yeah. words. Yeah, major takeaways. Um, we make technology choices because that is the only way for moving from vision to execution to walk the talk. And uh, we believe the potential uh, is huge when combining data spaces with the concept of digital twins. And that is the path we want to take from power side. Um, a path we believe will be successful because as organizations move towards a digital twin approach when solving the uh, automation of processes internally and the integration of systems, um, moving into data spaces for sharing part of that data that you already have model as digital twin will be the natural next step and that is a path to success in the adoption of data spaces from our point of view we are engaged with our our community uh, moving forward and uh, eager to collaborate with organizations like idsa and uh, bdba in making uh, all this happen so Final uh, uh, sentence is not just vision. We have now software as part of release eight that works. And so let's work together towards making data space happen. Thank you. Thanks. Christina, now uh, is uh, perhaps you want to take the floor for introducing the panel and speakers. And I will do that for sure. Thank you very much. Thanks to Juanjo, CTO of uh, Fiber Foundation, and Dennis Wendland from his team, a technical lead and architect, who just gave a great demo on what's real already uh, by showing a demo with Alpha Trust. And yeah, before we um, ask our panelists to really come on stage, I know they're already there. Um, let me pick up um, something that we just heard from Juanco, where he said uh, we're not anymore in a vision phase. We actually have moved from vision to reality. And I uh, guess what we uh, heard about the last or saw uh, within the last um, 30 minutes showed that uh, pretty impressively. Um, and this is why it's also so exciting to now move to a panel to panel discussion because this is all about people that are there in realizing what was once a vision and what is now becoming reality uh, when we talk about Gaia X, about data sovereignty, and above all about data spaces. And also here, one more comment uh, from Juan Cogiero when he said, data spaces is actually a natural next step for those who have already started um, adapting with FIWARE. And with that, you can actually see that um, these three topics that Months ago, when we were started, uh, when we had started to bring our uh, program here together for the Fiber Smart Fest, we were still thinking of taking these topics on in a separate basis. Uh, but then we said it's much, much better to combine them because they are so much linked and um, one builds on another. And you can't, you cannot run a Gaia X without data spaces. You cannot run data spaces with a good infrastructure. So it really all comes together here. And this is why I'm so happy uh, to welcome our speakers for today. Um, before I'm introducing them, I just want to give a hint here to Tonya and Kui that the slides are currently not seen. Uh, this may be a line 
Ergo, okay, we're back. Thank you very much. So it's all good. If they disappear, this can sometimes happen. That's a matter of uh, maybe line stability. Uh, but we have our team in the background, which um, I, I think that will bring it then back up. Anyway, we have our heads with us. And for a panel, uh, this is good enough as we have the topics here um, with us. So first of all, let me introduce our uh, great speakers for today. So we have on board Andrea Lampa. She is Director of Projects at ICT Association of Slovenia, Head of ICT Innovation Network and Co-Chair at AI4SI, so AI for Slovenia, so welcome. We have Las Nagel, CEO of IDSA. We have Dawa Mersman, CEO of OSC. We have Ilka Lakaniemi, Innovation and Ecosystem Management or Manager, Alta University, and, um, and a few other roles as most of our speakers hold here too. And we have on board also Dr. Sabine Wilfling, Unit Leader, Public and Government with uh, SHARE. And um, to all of you, thank you very much for joining us today in this panel. And um, I know you run all different different roles towards or adding to the ones uh, with which I just introduced you. So if you want to um, introduce a little bit more uh, in a while, that's that's absolutely okay. Um, yeah. So let's let's move a little bit into um, into our panel for today. And um, with a few opening words, I want to dig into what we say, um, yeah, having a little bit of a look what's happening in the EU, what's happening with Gaia-X. And I know there is in parallel even a summit ongoing with Gaia-X, so we're very keen on maybe the one or other person can bring the hottest news from the stage there. But looking into uh, into the um, past months and maybe even two two years, so the the EU launched in different phases Gaia X, and um, the origin whose origin really stems from the German federal government uh, to create the next generation of data infrastructure for Europe, for its companies and its citizens. And with that, it also created a lot of hype actually around the world, um, as Europe is moving into. Uh, yeah, and to a sovereign um, approach here. It's not only about technology, it's really a sovereign approach. Um, this infrastructure needs to meet the highest standards. This is what was put on the agenda in terms of digital sovereignty and aims to foster innovation. And um, we know the target infrastructure is a very important thing that's uh, seen to be the cradle of an ecosystem where data and services can really be made available. Um, collated and then also shared in a trusted environment. And I'm very proud to be with you today because I know that all of you have really great uh, things to say around it. So um, I would be really happy if we can bring the slides up now. Um, Kui, Tonya, can you give me a hint if they come back here on, on the monitor? Okay, I believe they're working on it, but no worries. Um, we can also do that without our slides. So what I brought is four questions for today. And um, the very first one that I want to, with which I want to start straight away is, what makes Europe's plan for digital serenity so different actually, or so special? Uh, especially in, in these times, <laughs> started all before COVID, but we're now in and let's say hopefully at the end towards COVID, but what makes it here so so special? And if you allow me, I would love to place this question to our very um, first speaker here to Lars. Lars, would you like to take this on? Yes, uh, well, I I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, you can hear me, everything's fine. Obviously. Yeah, perfect. Good. So hello to all of you, to the audience. Uh, hello, Christina, uh, dear, dear colleagues on, on stage. Um, yeah, so well, what is different? Um, um, well, in fact, I think uh, be, be, before answering this, uh, um, it is not only different, it is supposed to be different. 
And uh, that is the reason why um, Europe came up with a, with a data strategy. Um, and it was for a, for a clear reason, um, because we've, we've experienced that in, uh, in the era of, of uh, digitalization, uh, some things have gone astray. Um, and uh, well, some, some developments uh, occurred which, which are not satisfying in order and, and in, uh, according to European values. So uh, we, we hear a lot about uh, fair uh, share of data, uh, data sovereignty and all these aspects. Um, we, we have this, um, well, uh, development that um, uh, a lot of technology and decisions on technology have uh, gone to, to Asia. Um, the co big consumer platforms uh, have gone to the, uh, to the US. And, and now, as uh, Thierry Breton and, and others mentioned, uh, the next fight, which is to win, uh, is uh, the one about uh, the use of industrial data. And, and therefore, uh, we have to come up with a, well, with a new approach. And as we are a little bit laggards uh, in, in uh, obviously, in, in, in uh, well, data economy, uh, we have to speed up first and second, uh, we have to really craft something which is different. And well, okay, what is different? Well, different first means uh, based on true European values. So what are European values? Uh, so it's uh, really uh, transparency, openness, uh, trustworthiness, uh, the fair principles for, for data sharing. Uh, so findable, accessible, uh, interpretable, reusable. Um, and well, perhaps to put it in a nutshell, data sovereignty. So, um, well, leaving everyone uh, the opportunity to decide what happens with his or hers uh, data set and the, well, the, the entity, uh, the individual, uh, this can be a citizen, so us, uh, this can be a company, uh, and this also can be uh, like uh, the government or the public. And uh, we have to come up with uh, well answer on on the future of um, uh, digital uh, with which answers these questions and which can um, uh, can can give an answer on this and well the core so we will talk about this later on so I won't make it too long um, and and I think the core principle uh, which we we've come up with so after uh, data sovereignty which is absolutely first for my uh, um, uh, from my uh, perception, uh, the, the second is um, to really have a federated approach, um, a really an open uh, approach, and what we so often call the uh, level playing field for data sharing. And therefore, we have to come up with uh, a lot of uh, agreements on different levels, um, and we have to come up with a soft infrastructure to arrange all this data sharing, and also with a uh, hard, so to say, hard infrastructure um, to really process and store data. And uh, well, that is the, the great twin of data spaces and data infrastructure. So the concept of data spaces and then Gaia X. Um, and then on the top, we can add AI. And at the very bottom, we can add quantum computing. And then the picture for Europe's digital decade and future uh, is drawn. And uh, well, that, that would be my, uh, my, my first answer to stimulate this discussion. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, this is already very comprehensive. And um, let me pick up the data exchange you mentioned that is um, yeah, also looking at citizens, but also in companies and administrations. And with that, um, I know Andrea um, being in uh, many of the roles she, she covers, also very active in GAIAX for Smart Cities. Um, Andrea, what are currently there the hot topics when it comes to data sovereignty and maybe looking a little bit on what you're guiding there or what your idea there is? Well, first of all, let me say that we as Europe are very, very late in, in these discussions. If you just look at South Korea's digital new, new deal, it's really incredible to see the vision and dedication from the national uh, level for the digital transformations from the really highest political level. So I, I hope we as a Europe 
uh, will frog leap uh, and, and catch it. Um, but uh, if we are back uh, to the discussion on the uh, Gaia X hubs discussions, yeah, first, I think um, we need to build up the community, the ecosystem. This, I guess, uh, is right now the most important topic. So uh, how to how to connect the existing existing ecosystems working uh, on the ecosystems? Uh, how to connect the, the municipalities, the political level, the digital indus industry uh, to came together and discuss the, the common data spaces, the interoperability, um, how to talk to, to each other and act. I would say shortly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's um, a, a very good insight. And obviously, uh, thinking of your almost warning message at the beginning, we are late. It's really about speeding up. And um, with that, I would uh, also like uh, Davor to make a statement here because Davor, you've been uh, you've been in this role and around for for. for quite some time. We've just signed um, a strategic collaboration agreement uh, yesterday uh, between FIWER and OSC, um, which is obviously much wider, uh, but we've been also working together before. What would you expect here when when it comes to, um, to interoperability that should help to speed up certain processes? And maybe also a, a statement about open source and FIWER. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll integrate all of that. So th thank you, Christina. So I, I think, um, you know, looking um, a bit from a, a, let's say, maybe a, a good or um, appropriate distance at the data spaces discussion and kind of also having some of the overview, um, not just in Europe, but, but uh, globally also on what's happening at that uh, local level uh, connecting. I think there are a, a number of things that, that should be taken into consideration in the discussion. So first, when we say, you know, we, we need to speed up, I think the, f the fundamental question uh, there is uh, towards uh, uh, to where, right? Uh, I think um, the, the, the notion that uh, Europe is, you know, lagging behind or on this or that front, I think, fails to capture um, the, the, you know, the, the, I think the, the original question is the what's so different, I think, um, the, the, you know, we're a very cooperative, collaborative uh, economy. And in that sense, yes, we are uh, lagging behind on having the, 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 the data spaces that reflect uh, that, that nature. I think there's also the, um, the backdrop of uh, economies themselves uh, shifting, right? And, and uh, you can see energy degrading, and then there's a bunch of uh, kind of these, these verticals, and obviously they all come together in the location uh, on, on a local level. But the responsibility of at least having some local governance involved uh, with, you know, that, that kind of decentralized um, uh, uh, economy um, uh, evolution uh, is exacerbated by the, by, uh, the, the data factor. Huh? Because, of course, as uh, cities, and I'm sure uh, my colleague Ilka will have uh, some, something to say there as well, uh, as cities, there is um, you know, a, a role of steward, uh, cities, towns, rural areas, uh, a role of stewardship also of uh, protecting some, some of the, the, the basic rights and so forth. So I think th there's this dimension of, of uh, governance uh, that uh, really needs um, not just you know, to be talked at, but to be kind of ingested uh, in, in the way this thing is being built. Um, because if one thing, I think a lot of the local levels have learned that the if we build it, they will come approach uh, that was taken with open data. It doesn't necessarily um, you know, satisfy uh, the initial uh, projections in terms of impact, apart from the low hanging fruit um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that happens. And then after that, it's a bit of a, you know, a bumpy road. So I think um, the, the, the conversations that take place should be pointed at the right level and you know, with, with the right uh, volume. Uh, and you know, I'd also maybe challenge the view that, that we, we have all the ingredients uh, now. I think that's maybe not, not the, the right um, uh, statement to make so early on. Um, for example, the, the you know the, well services are in, um, customizing, becoming individuals. So it means they involve 
uh, personal uh, data. And if you want those services to scale, the governance um, you know, mechanisms need to scale with them. Same with the, the AI factor. It's not, a, I think, an afterthought. Eh? It's something that needs to be um, governed from the ground up. And those ingredients, kind of that humanistic approach in the development of the technology, will not only protect uh, the, that you know the path we're on is the sustainable one, but is actually also the the part that the other world regions um, like us, love us for, and that the the, the things that they are you know kind of uh, uh, picking uh, from us. Uh, so in our conversations, I mean, l look what's happening in uh, I heard Korea, but uh, both Korea and Japan are looking at GDPR as you know very good examples of how to get those things. Yeah, up. we can see that. There's okay. a number of other things there. Um, uh, as well, where we, uh, you know, uh, show the roads. But happy to uh, elaborate for Yeah, perfect. Um, thank you, Dawer. Also, a very wide field that you that you're covering here. Um, uh, about the ingredients, um, Ilka, do you have the same opinion? What do you believe? Do we have the ingredients all there to make this um, European, different European approach to digital sovereignty a success? I think we do. I think it was uh, excellent remarks by, said by my fellow speakers here. I'm very happy to be part of the panel, so many thanks for the invitation. Uh, what I basically do is that I have two two uh, distinct hats. So I work very directly with, with the businesses on uh, the realizing the value of data and creating new business out of that. And at the same time, I work at the Aalto University. I actually head a research institute where platform economy and data economy are being researched uh, by funding from the European Commission and the Business Finland and, and agencies of that kind. And that lessons learned from those projects are then transferred to say, simpler language towards the business leaders. So that's uh, especially my responsibility. And there are two messages that I would like to start. Uh, so the first one is that the IT used to be somewhere in the back room of the companies. So they were the guys with the hoodies on and doing stuff as a cost center. Uh, now data and especially the value of data and understanding that value is bringing uh, the, uh, the ICT world smack in the middle of the, data, the business strategies of the business units and the strategies within those companies. And that is the key key change that which is currently happening, and it actually it is an advantage for European companies if we tackle it in the right. I think we have the uh, part of the right ingredients for that, but there is a lot of work still to be done. Uh, Thank the second, you. Oh, okay, yeah. sorry, I'll cut it. The second point still okay. Yeah. The well. yeah. <laughs> so uh, let let me do the second point, and then I'm happy to be part of the discussion there. So uh, someone mentioned it already, and I think Dabur uh, rightly reflected to the fact that the, uh, the cities and the human-centric development of the type of services is there in the middle. And I think that's exactly the point, because we are now moving more and more into demand side of uh, data economy instead of talking about the supply of different technologies and different tools. So we need to bear in mind that whenever we, we uh, talk about data architectures and data tools and, and, and different things, we have to, at the same time, work on that. What is the real demand, whether we're talking about individuals, cities, businesses and all, all that. And there again, there is a lot of work to be done. And I think we excel in that in, in Europe. But I'll end in there. Yeah, okay. You you mentioned one one point that I want to use as a bridge to pass to pass that to Sabina because Sabina, you are um, actually from a from a company from a you are one of these business leaders and you are very close to um, let's say to the um, to the business spaces in terms of consulting in terms of um, creating and defining or designing projects but at the same time you're also a very active member of the GaiaX community. Um, what would you like to add to Ilka and to obviously our others? Yeah, thanks, Priscilla. Yeah, thanks, everyone. I think we, we already have um, very good points from a, a data sovereignty level, but also from a cloud sovereignty level. We talked about the demand side of how to um, gain that and to push that data economy. 
So from my perspective, um, as being very near, as you said, to the business, I can add two things. I think on, on the one hand, as Andrea said, we're a little bit late in Germany, especially in, in my sector, when we look at public, we need to push out. We need to form digital services. We need to, to, yeah, to be a little more innovative. We need to use more cloud infrastructure and to ramp there up. And um, to my idea, Gaia X is one of these big projects, which is keeping that vision and making that alive. On the one hand, we are able to support um, businesses and companies to um, be to trust into cloud infrastructure and to get in that clouds, because at the moment uh, the mechanism which is Gaia X, um, yeah, making available like security, like data sovereignty, data exchange, that is at the moment missing. And that on a balanced level, that everyone can share data, can use data, can be able to be innovative and gain services. And therefore, I think the European um, understanding of digital sovereignty is to do that in an open-hearted and open way, but also very um, secure and trustful. And this pass, um, to my yeah, opinion, we can go with GaiaX. And I'm very happy that two years ago we started and it's still there and um, yeah, the vision and where we are, uh, to my opinion, it's a good step, but we have still to be fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still there and it's growing and it's even a, a legal entity now. So uh, I think this is all great signs that this is becoming reality. And I would love to um, move to our next slide, which should give us um, a teaser about um, what roles do also, um, yeah, reference architectures and, and standards in general, but also global standards mean to make um, the data spaces that we all need and that um, successful. Now, um, I don't want to necessarily run in the same sequence, but uh, when I think of data spaces, I think obviously of, of Lars, right? <laughs> so Lars, a reference architecture and, and, and data spaces. Why is that so important? Um, and can we can we shed some light on what the state of the art is? Um, well, state of the art, yes. Uh, later, um, so well, which role do do reference architectures, uh, global standards play? Um, well, uh, we we we've learned a lot about. Um, why we need data spaces, why we need like digital sovereignty, so data and cloud sovereignty. Um, and well, we have a uh, heard a lot of different uh, like, like viewpoints on, on this whole endeavor. Um, so uh, it's uh, when we talk about data spaces, um, then the, it is mostly seen as a technical challenge. Yes, it is. But besides being a technical challenge, it is, uh, uh, well, first of all, for, 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 for um, Europe's economy, uh, entrepreneurial uh, risk. And um, furthermore, we have to come up uh, with, with more dimensions. So uh, we, we have to talk about the legal perspective on, on this. We have to uh, focus a lot on operational and organizational issues. So. Um, we, when we talk about federated ecosystems, um, well, they are federated. So uh, there's, there's no one who's in charge. Um, and, and therefore, uh, um, well, the, the commission came up with a, a data governance act and uh, calls for a, for a soft infrastructure. That is what we need, right? So we need uh, some common ground um, for all data spaces to flourish. And uh, we have to come up with a certain set of agreements so that all the participants in the data spaces per domain and then cross data space and cross domain know how they interact. And uh, that is what uh, already Juanjo presented in the, in the presentation before. So we have this uh, paper from Open the Eye, uh, Design Principles for Data Spaces, and we reflect on the, on the building blocks and uh, there are technical building blocks, but there are also building blocks related to governance, so organizational, operational, and economic perspective. Um, and we have to, well, to explain how all of this uh, sticks together so 
uh, which building blocks we need uh, so that we can assemble data spaces. And uh, that absolutely and immediately targets to, to reference architectures. And um, if we know enough uh, what building blocks and what technologies in each building blocks are the right ones so that they are accepted by industry and that they really fit uh, the request and the need uh, of, of Europe's data economy, uh, then we uh, we have to, to standardize this. And well, data economy does not stop on Europe's borders. So we, we have to bring this immediately into global uh, standardization activities. And um, so, well, what we do need is um, a phase of convergence. Uh, that is that is outlined uh, in, in different papers. So Big Data Value Association uh, they they came up with this nice view graph. So we will probably have a phase of two years of, of convergence right now. So checking all the technologies, all the approaches, the concepts, the trust schemes for data spaces and, and see, okay, what can be reused? Then we have to assemble this to, to a kind of a best practice. And this, this will form the soft infrastructure for, data, for Europe's data economy. And uh, this is also outlined uh, in the in the Data Governance Act, for example, so uh, they are calling for a uh, um, data innovation board, and uh, well, th that is exactly the um, uh, the role and uh, the responsibility um, to to come up with uh, with with what is written on the uh, on the slide, which we do see. And I would like to end with my comment. So we we are here really in a in in a new new phase. We are um, encountering a, a paradigm shift in, in data management and in data economy. And um, what we are doing here for data sharing with data spaces, uh, it is uh, like um, establishing um, telecommunication. So, and uh, why is it so easy to move with my mobile phone from one country to another and to Rome? Because there's a, a, a one infrastructure out there, which is called GSM. And uh, why can I pay uh, with my bank account uh, uh, my car in the holidays in Spain? Well, because there's uh, the SEPA uh, um, agreements in place for, uh, well, a cross-national uh, banking. And we need the same soft infrastructure for data sharing. And, and that is exactly what we're currently talking about. GaiaX will be uh, the, the, well, the, the core pillar of this. And we need um, concepts, governance structures, and technologies. So uh, like what we provide from IDSA, uh, the building blocks and technologies from Fireware, um, rule book templates from Zetra, uh, a lot of other technologies and, and, and uh, concepts, uh, assemble it. And then we do have the GSM or SEPA for data sharing. Yeah, so all the all these ingredients and then um, uh, bringing it to a standardized approach. Um, uh, this is what I what I take away here. And uh, I would love to ask Ilka. Ilka, you came all the way from many many years knowing about Fireware. You were one of the number uh, day day one actually players. Uh, shall I say around with the foundation of anything that had to do with with Fireware. Um, so you're also a, a big fan and, and player in, with, with open source. Um, what is your, uh, where do you see that, that part? So what can open source play? Uh, um, what kind of role can it play in this journey that, that Lars just laid out? And where, could, where do you see um, fiber in that? Let's see if Ilka is still with us. Uh, Ilka, you are on mute. Let's uh, give him a second because I saw him until really literally a second ago. Maybe he had a connection problem or I was just asking two questions too quick. <laughs> Ilka, we can see you back, that's nice. Uh, okay, yeah, we can see that you have a little bit low um, 
connectivity. But um, try to switch off your camera and the volume on. Very often this works. Other than that, you can also refresh. Oh, now I think you're coming back. Can you just speak? Okay, then I would say, I would, um, until, until we get Olka back here on stage, um, let me ask um, Davor, um, Mims, yeah. give us a few ideas where Mims fits in all this. Yeah, so, so you know, the, um, the, the, what Mims tried to do is, um, and this is, you know, speaking for the demand side of the um, uh, smart cities domain, if you want to call it that, um, the, um, is try to, um, you know, uh, through interoperability, create an addressable market uh, through, through mechanisms uh, that allow cities to share services, data, solutions amongst them, uh, but of course also uh, to, to uh, co be coherently addressed and coherently interact uh, with with the supply side of the market, um, so the you know the, the work we do, yes, uh, it has um, uh, technical underpinnings, uh, but there's a um, uh, I think you know for for, for standards uh, and architectures, we we don't really you know go deep into the architectures for us. They're you know uh, it's a more of a useful tool of, of representing um, um, you know um, MIMS and and logic of them. Um, the um, the, the standards need to be adopted, and I think uh, the, 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 the big problem with uh, our domain is that uh, there's a lot of standards and there's a lack of adoption, uh, and it, it boils down to being able to explain the, the use, uh, because I think ultimately uh, demand drives these types of uh, transformations, uh, so not just because uh, procurement represents 20% of the economy, but ultimately solutions fit uh, demand and then uh, uh, capital, of course, supports solutions, and therefore uh, that, that that kind of uh, makes the the circle round. Now, um, so that means that demand has to kind of demand standards uh, and interoperability for this whole thing to to work sustainably. Um, so, so there is, uh, you know, three three fundamental dimensions I think that uh, kind of should boil down into uh, technical standards. Uh, they're, they're, you should think of them as kind of institutional capabilities for the digital age uh, for local levels. Um, one is the impact dimension. I, I start with that because actually uh, that's why uh, cities do, do stuff. Eh? They want to achieve a certain target and ultimately also need to measure results and, and know how, how well this worked or not. Eh? So that's kind of a driving factor. You need the, uh, to do that, to achieve results economically and also kind of optimally in terms of um, uh, output, you need to interact uh, as a local level. You need to work with other local levels, with third parties, uh, whatever works uh, uh, to uh, achieve those objectives. And you need to do that um, you know, securely, safely, with, uh, you know, uh, with, with integrity, let's say. So in a protected way so that uh, you don't just uh, lose data, that you, um, uh, you know, follow the law, that you uh, even go uh, beyond that in terms of uh, ethical principles and so forth. Uh, you know, so those are, I, I think, are three fundamental dimensions that every city kind of uh, has and actually every person uh, has in terms of, uh, you know, achieving objectives. And from there you can uh, see, okay, what do you need? So for the interaction, we have the, the excellent work uh, uh, that, that has been, um, uh, sometimes it gets a bit maybe snowed under, but I think uh, Huangho and team for years, I mean, are essentially the driving force behind the ISG SIM uh, standard uh, from, from uh, founding it collaboratively to then also being uh, one of the main, you know, engines behind uh, its growth and so forth, including uh, the, the great work done with Seth. So I think that's a really good kind of um, uh, capability that's out there is, you know, there is a way to consistently uh, exchange context, which is kind of the, the step one. And then there's the work on the data models. I think it took some uh, time in find, finding a, a good model uh, that, that, you know, uh, uh, let's say allows um, or has a good shot of, of working together with that broker and still being open and, and uh, having good governance in place to, to grow. So that's something, of course, that, that will now be uh, kind of exploring how to optimize that in terms of the smart cities domain uh, going forward. Uh, I think the location component, uh, that, that's also a very important one, eh? where, where is stuff, and that, of course, relates then to the digital twin. Uh, in terms of the integrity aspects, um, so, so I'm kind of going over the memes now. So we have 
uh, the trust dimension. So uh, that's you know currently um, the personal data management. It may expand to something later, uh, depending on what uh, you know cities see the, uh, where, where the need is. So that that's work that's been done uh, in Helsinki now with with a vengeance, you could say, very very. Uh, um, um, uh, in an accelerated fashion over the past ha half year. So we'll be uh, publishing the outcomes of that as a uh, hopefully progress state MIM uh, for on personal data management. On FAIR AI, that's the work from Amsterdam that will also have some uh, uh, capabilities um, uh, progress. That's all happening at the General Assembly next week. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, on those dimensions, we also have um, a white paper coming out uh, on kind of data ownership control that you know kind of binds things together I think in a similar fashion uh, to what fireware does so in, in a sense I think what we need are kind of these these uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, you know yeah they enable interoperability but they reflect a need they reflect a capability so rather than saying okay let's you know what's the the, the added value or, or the layer on top that we can do, we should look at, you know, if we're, you know, looking at digital twins and kind of look at them as really as digital twins, as, you know, digital twins outside of the, the physical realm, you need to build that city from the, uh, uh, from the ground up. And so you basically need to say, okay, what, what, what do you need in terms of the, the, plum, the, the piping, the plumbing, the, the sewage? I'd like to t take this on, Davor, if you allow me, um, to, to yeah. also involve Sabina one, once more, because you were mentioning the um, uh, the demand side, and with all the different topics that, that you just mentioned, I think it would be very interesting for, it's interesting for our audience, how, what, what do we hear or see currently from, um, from, let's say, from your customers in the widest field, um, Sabina, is there, is there a big disorientation Orientation? Can you can you help them in finding orientation? Um, is, is, is some of these ingredients that we heard already been picked up and put into into place somehow? What what you, what you tell to your customers? Mm. Yeah, um, as you say, I think there is um, not a, there is some disorientation for sure. If we look at uh, smart city and um, the digital transformation of the public sector, there we need guidance and reference architecture as well as standards are the base for that. Um, so our customers in different fields, if we look to health industry, if we look to the public industry, if we look to smart city, they're lacking that. Um, it's, it's somehow vice versa. On the one hand, they're lacking and on the other hand, they need to put themselves in to create and to, to build these reference architecture as for example, Fiverr is doing it for the smart city area. And uh, if you allow me to, to talk a little bit on Gaia X, Gaia X, we're at the same stage. We're like um, um, describing the kind of architecture of standard and the, the rules. And this is, I think, one of the important bases that in the end providers can offer the date, their data and their services. And therefore we need to, yeah, to go through this process. I think Lars explained it very good as he said, okay, we need to put, put out these building blocks and these building blocks for the later data spaces or for the different marketplaces um, that will be created for, for our customers through um, yeah, suppliers and so on. Um, this, this is the base and therefore we, we need to yeah, work hard to put that reference architecture together and these standards for the different pillars, for the different marketplace areas, for the health area, for the public area and so on. But um, as with Fiverr and also with, with the EDSA, for example, where we have um, core components mm -hmm, and also with other standards, I think it's a, it's a good way to go, um, to go this way and to always put into yeah the customer and the consumer in front to make that proof that it's architecture. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, uh, let me see if uh, if we have Ilka back uh, with volume. Ilka, can you say hello? <laughs> I think we still have a problem. I, I wanted to uh, really still place my question. Ilka, can you hear us? Can you nod your head? Yeah, somehow, sometimes, somehow silent there. Um, maybe I can ask my team, uh, Tonya Kui, to engage with Elka on the other side and see if we can somehow bring him in a better way in. 
Um, I think it's the stability of his um, of his line. But then let me uh, let me ask a last question when it comes to the slide that we've just seen to Andrea. So. Um, um, you are also on the side of of of, real, of realization, and um, I would be interested, maybe in a in a different role from your side, uh, being in Slovenia. How do you see that going on in the let's say smart cities area? If if we want to have um, a, a more focused view on a, on a vertical, how are how is adoption going there with the ingredients that we just heard? Are you able to bring to move projects there already to the next level when it comes to reference architecture, when it comes to data models? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, coming from Slovenia, uh, we were able to engage with the uh, public administration, uh, bring together the ecosystem uh, to help and persuade the public administration to go really uh, with a vision uh, from the beginning of the development, uh, let's say, of, of the national strategy for the smart cities. And um, I can only say the consensus is, is essential and even mandatory. Uh, just imagine for a brief moment that the potential of connected and interoperable data spaces. Uh, and if I go to the, to the level of Europe, um, what can be the potential for the acceleration of the European data and digital economy? There cannot be a single European market without standards and, and interoperable data models and data spaces. Uh, and um, to, be honest, to be honest, it's great uh, to have now Gaia-X, uh, which will enable the pan-European discussion on, on data spaces and infrastructure sovereignty, especially on the business level and business models. And coming back to Slovenia, um, I guess the, the fir first round was very, very successful. And now we are looking uh, forward to, to de develop the vision uh, with public administration of Slovenia further. and and maybe go for the uh, meme level three uh, with the next one. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Andrea. Yeah, and I, I, we're looking really very excited towards what's happening there because it, uh, um, it looks like you're becoming really a, um, an example and a, uh, a point of reference um, uh, when it comes to, uh, to strategy and implementation. Um, yeah, um, yeah, you mentioned- yeah, uh, yeah, they're small. Sorry, it it really helps that we are a small country and uh, it's easier to bring together the the stakeholders. Yeah, I can I can see that, and this is some sometimes uh, what we face also uh, when we work in other countries. Um, and it, it just honestly brings brings comes up to my mind when just thinking about Berlin, how difficult it is uh, just talking about one capital very often. <laughs> and then um, you know I can see when a, when a country works much closer, much more efficient together, you have also different speed, of course. Um, but let me pick up again a word on data spaces, um, as you said and move move to the next uh, next slide um hope my team can yeah thank you i will uh, go to that one and um this would be the last one before we come to our final statements um because i think it would be nice to see okay what's now really required or how do we want to design um the data spaces in a way that they're creating really lasting impact and um let's see if uh Ilka's back. I really want to love to hear him again. <laughs> can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I, will, I cannot repeat the question from before because we moved on yes. a little bit. I'm sorry for no, that. No, per per perfectly okay. And, and, and then I, okay, I, I, but still I want to really have you with us. Yeah, so go ahead, go on. Yeah. No, technology is, is like this from time to time. So we, we should bear that in mind when, when we think. I, I would very briefly go into the, uh, the lasting impact part, as, as you said. Uh, when we talk about demand, uh, we, we should really understand, like I think all of us do, that the smart cities or businesses, be those SMEs or large enterprises, are not homogeneous. Uh, they're, they're looking for many different things from the, from the data spaces as such. And then we should really adopt the, the data spaces strategies and the architectures in a way that it, it's kind of a customized 
uh, for, for the specific needs of, of those companies. And, and where we can excel, I think, with Gaia X and, and, and with other European initiatives is that actually, instead of looking into verticals, we will focus our activities in the cross-sectoral domains, in the areas where, where really the data brings added value beyond optimization and, and seeking for productivity gains or efficiencies into specific verticals. We're looking into cross-domain opportunities where actually combining the data from say the financial sector to the traditional manufacturing sector is where the where the new opportunity lies and and we have already evidence of that here in finland and in the nordics we have been working quite uh, quite a lot on those type of use cases and the more we have those use cases uh, that we can showcase and highlight and, and give evidence to the companies i think that's that's what we need for the lasting impact and if you bear with me one, one, one second more, uh, I was one of the persons who actually sold GSM and, and, and the telco world to the world. So basically going around and talking that now we have this wonderful telecommunications network technologies, uh, what it is that we can do with it. And, and, and when we did that, we went very directly into different uh, industry groups. We went to associations of of, of people coming together similar to OSC and others and, and really try to work with them to co-create the type of services that they would need. And, and I think that's that's where we need to excel also and put a lot of effort to. Uh, okay, when it comes to co-creation, we obviously need to have open platforms and open open standards and open data exchange. Uh, let me allow one more question, maybe a little bit to the one that you may not have heard before when uh, when the line went down. But um, you've come all the way uh, from the very first day that fiber was fiber technology was created. Um, where where do you see? this role for now and the future as an enabler of, of data exchange and, and data spaces. I'm, I'm sure you, you have a, a, an opinion on that that's quite clear. Yeah, it, it, when, in 2012, when I actually moved from Nokia to Aalto University, Fiverr was one of the first projects that I came across with and started working very closely. With the, uh, with, with the team working on that, including Juan Ho and, and the others. And I was very happy and I'm pleased now that over the years it has become uh, the enabling technology, but beyond the technology, it is the ecosystem that it brings to the table. So that it brings to the table the various parties that are developing the technology, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the communities and entities that we need in there that we understand that what is needed from the technology itself. So that when you talk about enabling technologies, you have to, bear, you have to think also that what are the different elements that make the most sense for uh, the specific customers as such. And I think this, what I have been pleased to say is that we, we started from a technology project in Fiverr and moved more and more to focused sectors and to focused areas where the technology itself is, is, uh, is not the core, but it's the, the offer that you can really have for, for the sectors. And then you look at the technologies that you can best use for, for that offer. Uh, kind of yeah, thanks, Olga. Okay. This is... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, um, I'm i very grateful that you also talk about the ecosystem because it is it is a strength of Fiverr. It's also one of the reasons why we're running a Fiverr Smart Fest these days. Uh, uh, we're now in day two. We have another day to go or actually one and a half days still to go. Um, and it is at the end the power of a community and the power of co-creation that brings really things forward. So thanks for mentioning uh, this here. Um, we, we have just a few more minutes to go, six, seven minutes, and I would love to move to the last topic that I think can be quite exciting as well, because um, we all come here from different angles, but we have one big thing in common. We all work somehow in or around Gaia X these months. And um, it, as exciting as it is, it's sometimes also creating some fear to people. 
And um, on the other side, it is um, we have this, this this idea that we really need to keep updated all the time, as so many things are happening. And as I said, um, uh, just today there is another summit ongoing. So. Um, I cannot give a complete road now what's really next. I'm not sure if one person can really look into this glass ball, but I think if we can bring the brains here together with the last statements on um, where do you, what's really currently happening on the Gaia X front, so what is the hottest topics that you see these days, and what are your personal expectations where this road's going within the next, let's say, 12 to 24 months. Um, and if you like, you can also give a, um, a tip or an idea for companies, administrations, and maybe also society, um, what this means uh, in, um, in evolution and disruption. So wide field, but if you can keep it with, let's say, one and a half minute per person for your late last statements on Gaia X front and your personal expectations that would be gorgeous. And let me start, let me start with Davor. One and a half minute, off you go. Okay, does the, does the funding count or not? Uh, so um, uh, I think for, for the smart cities and community side, without a doubt, the next uh, 12 to 18 months will be, in terms of data space, will be occupied uh, on uh, climate and uh, green deal uh, data spaces. So we have been you know, kind of working uh, with uh, the whole of Europe or, or parts of it um, in uh, establishing, I think, uh, what is a good baseline, I think, in which we can really bring the data that is needed for cities to undertake climate actions in the context of their broader uh, engagements with the Commission, but also, of course, the commitments that they have uh, in their policy um, and, uh, and public uh, arenas, respectively. Uh, so that's definitely a big, um, a, a, a big uh, uh, focal point. And to do that, it's all hands on deck. So that means we need to dive into lower TRL levels from the demand side, demand to pull it up. Uh, so that's a second dimension, I think, where we need to be more proactive uh, to, to engage uh, all kinds of actors and uh, you know test stuff out that will help uh, with that uh, um, ambition. And then the third aspect is solution orientation. We need to start uh, creating clarity on what's available, what works, uh, what works in one city will work in another, that whole part. It's also all about data. Uh, but on the other hand, a good solution will drive cities to adopt, uh, they, uh, to open up their own data because it they will need uh, it to operate the solution and so forth and so forth. So I think it's it's about climate, it's about um, uh, uh, the the well and, and, and solutions uh, essentially whatever TRL level uh, they're at. So yeah, happy to work with uh, any uh, stakeholder on that topic in the next month. Thank you. Um, I could ask who wants to be next, but I see actually Sabina smiling. How about you? Sure. Yeah. Christina, to, to, to make it perhaps short, I think Gaia X, where are we? 2021. I think on the one hand, we're in the reference implementation to put the next steps there on the technical level of the architecture at the end of the year, the federated services. And based to that, we're like in creating that marketplaces in the different areas. So to speed up in health sector, to speed up in public sector, to speed up in smart city sector. And this is for me, I think, the most important point to put their emphasis and to, uh, I think, as Ilka said it, to trigger that cross domain data spaces, for example, to put together public more with economy and to create services that make, um, yeah, that make it a little bit easier for the people, but also for the economy to put together uh, some emphasis on this. Um, when you, you ask me, okay, what, what am I expecting of Gaia X? So to my opinion, at the moment, we are having a cloud market, which is not fair, meaning that um, an efficient and fair data infrastructure as Gaia X is offering it, um, we have the option to do that big digital transformation for many sectors and to put the data into a fair exchange for everyone, for small size, for medium size, and customers, consumers, and that makes it different uh, in the EU instead of uh, the US and instead of China. 
And therefore I would say, yeah, let's emphasize on this and put the customer first and, and work on it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, thanks Sabine. Andrea, um, your expectations on the GAIA-X front, you're very active there. What are, is your plan or the plan of the community you're working with? Uh, uh, to my opinion, it, the GAIA-X is definitely a step into the right direction, but it needs to um, outgrow a little bit the, the private initiative of some countries and companies uh, to be the the European harmonized strategic development uh, according, according to the European va values. We need to understand that uh, some countries on the high, highest political level already recognize the opportunity and they're fighting really hard for the competi competitive ad advantage of their economies. The new cards, the new winning cards are dealt right now. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. That, <laughs> very nice. Okay. Uh, Ilka, one more sentence before we close with Lars. We have for all two minutes to go. So let's go for it. Well, I think Ilka will still play around with the microphone once more. I'm so sorry for that. Lars. Uh, then I would um, pass the last word to you. Um, you and your you have a very driving role in Gaia X, and um, uh, there is no day we'll get not um, any updates from on the OASC side uh, and uh, uh, sorry on the ideas A side or if on, on on seeing you personally even in uh, throughout all channels. What is your uh, Gaia X um, viewpoint that is the strongest one for the next twelve to twenty four months? Yeah, so um, we, we shall not be uh, anxious about uh, Gaia or see this as an uh, as an uh, threat. Um, for me, uh, there's no alternative to to have Gaia because um, uh, we have a very scattered landscape uh, of technologies and initiatives uh, in the context of of data spaces and also a lot of projects and use cases. So we have great use cases, great small data spaces. Now we really have to to go the next evolutionary step to really go for data spaces which are on a European scale uh, and which are business driven. And uh, that is what Gaia has achieved. They brought data spaces to sea level attention and to top political attention. And, and therefore, we shall reuse all what has been done. So, Fireware, IDSA, uh, data sharing coalition from the Netherlands, data sharing rulebook, whatever, sort out what is the best or what is usable and make good suggestions, best practices to build data spaces. And Gaia X will, will pave the path and we will all, all go along on this. So, convergence and teaming up. And uh, that is what I do see, um, really flourishing data spaces in health, energy, mobility, um, finance, um, built on Gaia with the help of all components, blocks, technologies, which are already out there, for example, Fireware. And um, we will see this uh, hopefully beginning of next year. And uh, yeah, we should all join forces. Thank you very much, Lars. And then as this is a federated system, we can all make part of that and play a, an important role in making this a success. Um, for this, uh, we shared again with my colleague Max here um, the white paper for um, for data spaces that I invite you all to download and share. And um, yeah, we came to an end now. This wasn't a tremendously interesting panel and I really would love uh, to give a big thank you to you as the guests for today so thank you so much to Ilka I know a little bit uh, in troubles with the microphone but we got however lots of great messages from your side too thank you very much to Davor Mersman to Sabine Wilfling Andrea Lampe and last but not least uh, Lars Nagel thanks to all of you uh, so we make it and we hear each other next time when we climb the next little mountain, okay? Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, and you have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.